Welcome to the Wonder Learn Podcast. I'm your host, Francis Tampon. In this episode, I have Dan Greck, who is an Australian who has traveled overland through Africa, through how many countries in Africa? Uh, I traveled through 35 countries. 35 countries in Africa. You did it over three years? That's right. Yep. And you, I think you were planning to do, and so in the end, uh, you were probably planning to do probably two years and then it got extended. That's exactly right. In fact, it wasn't uh, three years. It was 999 days. <laughs> Dan, Which, you and I got to talk. Yeah, I know. I, my marketing I, Dan, agent's not very happy about that. I, I'm very pissed off at you right now. <laughs> One fucking more day, dude. I know. You I should have like, delayed my plane ticket or something. Did you not know at the time that it was 999? No, I had no idea. I, uh, it, was oh. a, it was a real scramble to like finish the trip, get the Jeep in a shipping container. and like So it shipped out. And I went back to the hotel and tried to book a plane ticket, booked it, and then had like one more day in Egypt. So kind of wandered around, you know, grabbed a coffee, whatever. And then I looked up the dates of when I'd gotten into Morocco and when I was flying out and it was 999. (laughs) Okay, so I got to teach you a trick that we do in Africa, which I'm sure you've done. or Maybe you haven't done. Maybe you're an honest person. You look like an honest person, (laughs) unlike me, a criminal. You go into the passport and then you scratch out and change the date. Right. I, That's I, all you got to do. I met a few people that. doing this kind of thing and like it never really ended well for them. <laughs> hey, it ended well for me. <laughs> Good. Glad to hear it. Um, although one time I did get deported from Chad because I did that. Okay. So that may not always end good for, for, yeah, for buyer people, beware. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, okay. So 999 days, but between you and my listeners, we're just going to say a thousand. Okay. We'll go with that. This was part two of a, I don't know how many part journey that you're going to be going on. I imagine this is not going to be your last journey. That's right. So give people a background, Dan. You were born in Australia and then you moved to another former colony of the United Kingdom. That's right. I moved to Canada, Francis. Uh, I wanted to go snowboarding. I wanted to go hiking, camping, you know, all the good stuff in the mountains. Um, And I loved it. It was amazing. But I was working as an engineer sitting at a desk. And it just wasn't making me happy. You know, I I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life until I turned 65. And so I started dreaming, what else can I do? What else is out there? Um, And I had a little Jeep Wrangler at the time. And so I quit my job. I threw everything in my Jeep and I drove up, drove up to the top of Alaska, right up to the Arctic Ocean and, you know, went hiking, camping. Stop, Stop for one second. That Jeep Wrangler, how many miles had it had on it or kilometers when you, before you set off? That little Jeep, um, I bought it used and it had uh, 70,000 miles on it when I bought it. That's not the same one that you took to Africa. No, a different Jeep. Ah, uh, got it. Okay, yep. continue. Yep. So little Jeep, drove it all the way up to Alaska, had a phenomenal time for the summer, you know, saw bears and glaciers and all that kind of good stuff. And then I mm. turned around and wanted to keep adventuring. So I started driving south and I ended up driving all the way to Argentina. So all the way through Central and South America. Uh, and as you can imagine, I mean, the adventure was unbelievable. I, I poked lava with a stick. You know, I went scuba diving. I climbed a volcano. I did what happened time. to the stick? <laughs> the stick, it, uh, it like vaporizes as soon as it touches the lava. Really? So, so as fast as you can push it in, it's just like there's nothing left anymore. Wow. Yeah. So do you, you didn't try your finger? I did not. No, but my you boots. Pussy. My boots you were fucking pussy. <laughs> my boots were <laughs> melting and like sticking to the rocks a little bit. So it was it was getting a bit real. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose. All right. Maybe you're a tough guy in the end. Yeah. Um, okay. So your your trip to um, Argentina, it wasn't actually planned. Like in other words, it wasn't like that was your objective when the moment you set foot. No, that's right. I just wanted to like have an adventure, whether it was going to be two months or six. And I just figured I'll keep going as long as I'm having fun. But the whole Mm. point was, you know, if I don't feel safe or I'm not having fun or I'm just or I run out of money, I'll give up and I'll do something else. And that was fine. Got it. it. And then why uh, Canada versus, let's say, New Zealand? Because New Zealand has plenty of nice mountains as well. I don't have a good answer for that. I guess <laughs> Canada's bigger, <laughs> maybe. I yeah. don't know. A little bit bigger, yeah. just a tad. More exotic, I guess. I was, I was ready to leave. <laughs> for, a, for you, you know, for you, it's exotic. Yeah. Of course, yeah. for us Americans, it's like. <laughs> yeah, you know, in Australia, we grow up stuck on this island, you know, really far away from the world. So I think we get right. to a certain point where we're like, oh, I just want to go and see what else is out there, you know, go have adventures far, far away. 
In all my world travelers, I'm always astounded whenever I meet an Australian because it's almost impossible to find an Australian who's traveling for less than six months. Yeah, you know, I think it, it costs so much for us to leave our island and it takes so long, you know, it's a massive plane flight. And so once you finally left, it kind of just makes sense to, to stay, you know, adventuring. It's easier to keep, or maybe, keep traveling. Or maybe Australia just sucks. Maybe that's it. I mean, maybe it's just a shitty place. <laughs> well, I, I'm not in a hurry to go back, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, <laughs> See what I mean? It's, there you go. <laughs> it's nice. It just isn't very exciting for me. It just kind of is like all the same, you know, that there isn't really a lot of culture. There's no language. There's no, you know, kind of challenges mm. like that. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So interesting. So, okay, so then you... But I want to go off and talk much more about the Africa trip because I'm fascinated by that. Yep. Um, you uh, did this Argentina trip. And what year was that? Sorry. That was from 2009 to 2011. Got it. So for about two, three years, two years you yeah. were going through Central and South America. Yep. And you got back to, at that point, Australia. You hadn't been in Canada. Uh, at that point. No, I went back to Canada. Okay. And then from there, you said... That was a lot of fun. Let's do it again. That's exactly what I said. And then, so, you know, first step is saving money. So I had to go back to work. So I actually went back to a desk job and, you know, worked for years and years to save up the money. What uh, desk job do you do? Uh, is it uh, cocaine? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm a computer programmer, actually. Uh, so, Almost the same thing. Yeah, nearly. Really. So, so I work for the telephone company, which is kind of like selling your soul. Um, yeah, but that so worked like effectively. It, it put money in my bank account, which, which was the goal. And so, wait, and how did you get a permit to work in Canada if you're an Australian? Yeah, they make it really easy between the former British colonies, as you mentioned. Um, and I've been here so long now that I'm a resident. So actually, Canada's my home. Wow. And it wasn't that complicated to just pick oh, up and move? Oh, no. It, it took about five years of paperwork. It was, it was okay. a lot of work. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. And so then from there, you started saving some money. Tell us a little bit about, because a lot of times I like to talk about the logistics of actually traveling, because for a lot of people that listen to you and me, they, they were talking about these crazy long travels. They, it looks unreachable, untenable. It's just out of, their, you know, out of their financial reach. And I try to teach people how to actually do it. And so why don't you tell us about, for example, what did you do as far as living expenses? Like you're earning a salary and then in, behind your desk job, but where were you living and how were you living? Yeah, um, I rented a room in a basement suite. So I was sharing with someone else. Uh, and so it was pretty cheap. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't the well, you were not You weren't sharing the actual room itself. No, sorry. Sharing like the little, you know, two bedroom apartment. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was cheap. It wasn't glamorous, um, but it worked. Uh, I cooked all how much did how much did the rent cost in this basement apartment? I was paying US dollars 500 Canadian a month. So that's only like 400 US a month. Wow. Okay, great. Um, and so and you had no view because you're in the basement. Exactly. And the winter was really long because I was in the basement. Oh, God. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, you know, and then just so you things. went to Canada for the views of the mountains and you ended up in a basement. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> pretty, pretty smart guy all around. <laughs> you're a very clever man. <laughs> <laughs> so then um, you worked for how long? I worked for four years at that job. Okay, got yeah. it. And then for four years, you're socking away the money. That's right. How would you, what would you do? Would you just put it in a bank or did you invest in stocks or any other kind of investment vehicle? Or what yeah, did you no, do? I just had a savings account um, and I set up an automatic transfer online. So every mm -hmm. two weeks on payday, you know, a certain amount of money would just disappear from my regular account and go straight into this savings account. What percentage of your income were you saving? Uh, approximately. Approximately. A quarter, a half? I'd say, I'd say a quarter, maybe 30%. Okay, not that, not as much as you probably you probably could have saved. I don't know. It depends on how much income you're making and your and your expenses. But sometimes I talk to travelers and they're easily able to save more than half yeah. of their income. Yeah. yeah, and I you know I was struggling to find the balance between still doing adventures where I was living, you know, getting out on the weekends, but mm. trying to save money. So yeah, I I tried hard to still enjoy myself while saving money. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't sacrifice everything just to, you just sacrificed your view. And, and I feel like what I did sacrifice, Francis, is the easy stuff that doesn't bother me. So, for example, I cooked all of my own food, so I would just never buy at a restaurant. Um, I love coffee, but I just put a rule on myself. I have to make it myself. I'm not allowed to buy it from a cafe because it's too expensive. 
you know, little yeah. things like that. I rode my bike to work even in the winter just to did save Did you money. have, did, did you not have a car? I did actually have like a $400 Subaru that I would get around in on the weekends. But okay. to save money, it would just made sense to ride my bike to work. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then how long was your commute? Oh, it was about 20 minutes on the bike. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not, not and bad. That's, but it's hardcore in the winter. Sorry, what part of Canada was this? What city? Or? I was actually in the Yukon, so right up next to Alaska. Holy fuck. That's yeah. cold as shit. It was minus 44 a couple of mornings when I was riding to work. Damn. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Damn. So, like, what, I mean, are you prepared for, like, overland, uh, walking across the Antarctica? Is that what you're training for here? No, on a no, bicycle, no. Maybe? I just... I mean, if you're going to live up there, you may as well kind of enjoy the winter. Like that's otherwise you're just sort of miserable. So I imagine that you're sitting in your basement, Dan, and then you're next to, do you have like a space heater or is it like a gas? Oh, I had a wood, it, wood stove actually. So I imagine if you're like more than a couple of meters away from the wood stove, it's fucking cold. Ah, uh, no, no. Once, once the wood stove has been running for a good 24 hours, you can get okay. it like toasty warm inside, even when okay, it's minus okay. 40 outside. Okay. Oh yeah. Great, great. It's kind of like a, a snow cave. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay. And so when did you do your like backpacking experience and camping experience? I did a lot of that in Canada kind of before the uh, Alaska to Argentina trip. What about nothing in Australia? You didn't, I mean, I know you guys don't have mountains in Australia, yeah. but. Very, very little. You know, I kind of just, my brother got me into it like once or twice. We went backpacking, I guess, but I really didn't didn't have time or I was at university and just never really got into it that much. It wasn't until I got to Canada that I really loved the outdoors. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. I mean, part of the problem is just the lack of mountains, except for wherever the tallest mountain is. I think it's like 7,700 feet or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, in the Great Dividing Range. It's kind of over in the east. Let's get into then how did you decide to go to Africa? Why Africa? Why not Central Asia or one of these other places? Yeah, when I got back from Argentina, you know, I was pretty exhausted. And so I wasn't really ready to start planning a trip, but I knew eventually I'd want one. So I started saving money like that was the first step and it was going to take a long time. And so while I was saving money, I just sort of was reading online, following other travelers, you know, researching. And the more I thought about it, the, the parts of South America that I loved the most were the real wild wilderness, you know, out there adventures across the salt flats in Bolivia, the Atacama Desert in Chile, the days when I was, you know, three or four days away from civilization. That's the bits I loved the most. And then so when I talked to other travelers and when I researched online, it just kept coming up that like, go to Africa, go to Africa and you'll get really far off the map. And, you know, you can go places where there's no tourists and you know, kind of hasn't been ruined yet. And so the, the more reading I did and the more I thought about it, it, it seemed like Africa would be an amazing adventure. And I started to really focus on it. And how did you plan your route? Um, I realized that if I was going to go to the trouble of shipping a vehicle all the way over there, that I may as well try and see as much as I possibly could, you know, because you've already invested the time and the money. And then, so I just came up with this plan to go right around the whole perimeter. Um, so where the vehicle it came from where i shipped it from canada across... well, what part of canada did, did uh, you have to you didn't did you ship it from what part exactly you were in, you were up in the yukon i was up in the yukon and i came down into southern canada and kind of the u.s to build it to because I, I built it into a house on reels so it's it's got a fridge it's got solar panels a pop-up roof it's got all these like living things to make it comfortable um, mm -hmm. and then i drove all the way across to the east coast of canada to halifax in nova scotia put it inside of a shipping container and it ocean freighted to Belgium. I flew across two weeks later, picked it up in Belgium. And then I drove down through France and Spain and caught a ferry to Morocco. Got it. Okay. And how much did it cost to put it in that Halifax to Belgium ferry? Yeah, it costs about two and a half grand to ship a vehicle like that from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world, roughly wow. speaking. It's not and, that bad. But then, I mean, anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, I mean, can't, it can't be the same price to ship it all the way to South Africa. Kind of is, yep. If you find wow. a shipping line, like maybe not from Halifax because maybe there isn't a direct route. So instead you drive down to like Jacksonville in Florida and then from there to South Africa, I know is really cheap. Friends have done it. Right. So why not just ship it directly to Africa is I guess my question. I figured that there would be a lot more bureaucracy and a lot more chance for bribery and, you know, kind of funny business if it landed in Morocco. So it just seemed easier to ship it into a first world country and, and a country where I could speak English. 
I see. Okay, yeah. All right, but but in the end, you have to then cross borders and you know do all that stuff. Did you had a not not a call the laissez passer? It's a um, carnet de passage. I actually didn't have a carnet de passage, which is quite controversial because up until now, people would say it's impossible to drive around Africa without one. Um, but I met other people doing it, and we all did it successfully, so it can be done. And you can add me to that list of people just like you. Very I cool. did not have a carnet de passage either. And, and I heard the same things you heard, which is, no, impossible, you'll never be able to do it. Exactly. And there are times where it's a pain in the ass, but you can always finagle away. Exactly right. Well said. The hardest part, at least one of the hardest border crossings for me, and I'm curious if it was for you, was going from Brazzaville to Kinshasa in that zone there, you know, basically Republic of Congo to yep. the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yep. Did you also, how did you deal with that? Did you cross between the capital cities? Like, did you find a way to get across right there? Or did you go downstream further? I went downstream further. I can't yep. remember the name. There was a place where it cost $15 or 15 yep. Yep. euros. Luozzi? Luozzi? Yes, I think that's yep. what it was called. That's exactly where I crossed. And it was relatively painless. Dude, oh. you're smarter than you look. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment, Francis. <laughs> Because I, th I mean, I don't know if you planned that out or if you read that, but I did. I, I did it the hard way. In other words, I went to from Brazzaville and I got you know, I, 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 I went to the shipping area and I said, well, fuck, it's only a kilometer across yeah, to get to the I, you can I can fucking swim there, dude. Yeah. I could probably put my car on my back <laughs> and swim across there. But so I said, how much is it? And it's like five hundred dollars or six. I'm like, what? Yeah. Yeah, I, I heard mean, endless tales of bribery and like they get your vehicle on a boat and then suddenly they want another $500 and it just goes up and up and up. I didn't hear that story, but it makes sense to me. Yeah. And I'm a pretty good negotiator and I got it down to like 350 and I was like sure that that was pretty much about as low as it's going to go. Yeah. And it wasn't going to go much lower and I was just still found that so ludicrously high. Yeah. That I was like, all right, there's got to be a different way. And that's when I heard about Ludozi, whatever it's called. Luozi. Luozi, that's right. Right, you had a good memory. Okay, so now was that not your most difficult crossing or what was, what was a more memorable crossing for you? You know, Francis, I didn't have any crossings that were like an utter nightmare. I didn't have any where I, you know, really struggled. Probably the most bureaucratic was Sudan into Egypt. That one is notorious with a vehicle for being just a pain of paperwork and hours. And, and actually, I paid a fixer because they won't let you do it without one. Right. And I would rather not pay for one, but I didn't have a choice at that border. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. But it ended up taking, was that the longest as far as hours? Yeah, yeah. It took about six hours, I think, from memory. Yeah. And yet it is actually, aside from the Western Sahara, really the easiest place to cross the Sahara. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah. In terms of infrastructure, like the roads right. were good and everything. Right. Yeah. I mean, try to do it any other way. It's it's a real, real challenge um, yeah. to go it any other way. OK, so now let's uh, dig down into the the actual map itself. Now, let's help the listeners. You go to the road chose me dot com, the road chose me dot com. And you can see Dan Greck's not just his adventure through Africa, but also you can learn about his Pan American Highway Expedition. You can see photos of his Jeep and kind of all his overland tips. And also the two books that he's written, uh, The Road Shows Me Part One and The Road Shows Me Part Two. So now I'm looking at your map, Dan, and you kind of were thinking about perhaps going th from Liberia, which is in West Africa, and cutting across. I see a red dotted line, like perhaps that was your intended route, and then That's the blue right. line is your actual route? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so tell us why, I guess you must have been, it looks like um, Guinea-Bissau, or somewhere around there, that you decided to hang a, a, hang a left, I suppose, go east, as opposed to go south. Uh, it was, I originally planned to go south down the west coast of Africa and then back north along the east. But at the end, from Egypt, I planned to drive back across through Libya and through Algeria. I, I had hoped to drive to Morocco, so to, 
to complete the full circuit of Africa. Ah, right, right, right. No, but I'm, yeah. I'm okay. We'll get to that, but yep. and that is interesting. But yep. I'm just talking about from let's say I don't. Did you go to Conakry? I did. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see where you mean. I didn't yeah. hug the coast. Uh, I didn't go through Sierra Leone and Liberia. Right. Yep. Okay. And that's what I'm getting at. Is that oh, okay? What, it, originally, you seem to have intended to go through Sierra Leone and Liberia, but then instead you seem to have deviated and decided to go to the wonders of Mali. Right. Right. There was a couple of reasons for that. One, the borders were closed because of the big um, Ebola outbreak that they'd mm. only just gotten under control. That so was like, 2014? I think 15? 15 and 16 15? was when it was bad. Okay. Okay, and yeah, so yeah. while I was in Guinea, it wasn't actually possible to drive into the Ivory Coast or into, I think Sierra Leone comes first. Do you want me to tell you a secret just between you and me, Dan? <laughs> it's possible anyway. Uh, the, no, it's just that I was there six months before the Ebola outbreak. I was there in 2014, six yeah. months before the Ebola outbreak. And I was the one who had concocted the Ebola thing in my laboratory, part of the CIA, <laughs> and I infected the people of West Africa, and it's I'm. It's a conspiracy theory that is correct. And were they I trying to were they you, trying to arrest you for that at every turn? They would, and unfortunately, they don't listen to podcasts, so I'm safe here. That's good. And and so basically, that is what caused the Ebola outbreak. And <laughs> six months after I left, it went gangbusters. And that's exactly when you came. In fact, my real purpose was to thwart your trip and to get you to go to Mali. <laughs> hoping that you would be kidnapped by Mali terrorists because I figured you might be attracted to go to Timbuktu, but you ended up not going there. So tell us about the story there. So you avoided Ebola. You avoided my plague that I had purposely put along my the footsteps that you were following. Exactly and right. You yep. deviated. You thwarted my grand plan. I did. And there was another reason that you might not have planned for. It was the rainy season. Um, Fuck. And, I, and in, never, I should have thought of that. In that part of the world, they get more rain in one month than the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. gets in an entire year. And for those um, who don't know, the Pacific Northwest gets a fucking lot of rain. Yeah, so it was raining like 10 hours a day of the heaviest rain I've ever seen in my whole life. Like so heavy, I didn't even think it was real. Um, yeah. And it got to the point I found mold inside the Jeep. I found mold on my clothes. And so I, I kind of hit my wits end after about a month of that in Guinea Conakry. And then so I heard that up in Mali, the rainy season was coming to an end because it's far enough north. And so mm -hmm. basically that just locked it in for me of like, oh, I'm going to Mali. <laughs> got an it, easy got choice. It. Yeah, yeah um, that makes a whole lot of sense. And, and, and believe me, as somebody who drove through West Africa during the rainy season, I drove through Sierra Leone. I never got out of second gear almost yeah, the right. entire country. Uh -huh. It was calling it a mud fest is really gentle. It I was... know exactly what you mean. It's it's <laughs> insane, isn't it? It's like a different planet. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I don't know how they they live with it every year um, all the time, but they do. It's 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 you know the spirit that they can they, are they tough can put people. up with it. Tough. Okay. So you get to Mali, go to Bamako. Which yep. how was Bamako, by the way? Oh, I loved Bamako. I stayed a couple of months. Actually, it was great. Fuck, really? Yeah, stayed in the Sleeping Camel right there by the river. It was great. With the Sleeping Camel is that a name of a hotel? Yeah, or it's resort? like a like a backpacker slash campground slash overland hangout. Did you get like some sweet deal, like a hundred bucks a month, and you get stay there? Well, that's about the regular price anyway. So yeah, because <laughs> I, I was just camping in the jeep in the parking lot. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, so you just pay for the parking. Okay, and and why did you decide to stay there? Did they just give you a three month visa or something? Uh no, actually, I had to go and extend my visa. Um, mm. I just loved it. You know, we were going out to see live music at night. I was eating street mm. food. My French was improving a lot. I was, we went up the river on a boat thing. Like I just having a good time and wanted to stay longer. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um, I also extended my Mali visa when I was there, going through there. Um, and it was relatively painless, I suppose. Yeah. Um, the visa process is the part of traveling through Africa that I would say is the absolute worst part of the experience. I don't know if you would agree. In West Africa, it definitely is like the big logistical challenge. It's the hardest part for sure. I don't want to say worst, but definitely hardest. Well, what's worse than getting visas in Africa? Getting malaria twice in Africa. I got malaria six times, so I know <laughs> what you mean. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> yes, I, I totally, uh, that does kind of suck. Um, but you know, I don't know if it, to it yes, I almost died once for, of the six times. Um, <laughs> but the first time I got it, which was in Ghana, 
it wasn't bad at all. In other words, it felt like the flu. Same for me. When I got it in Bamako, I was like, oh, this isn't such a big deal. What's everyone exactly. talking about? What are these guys yeah. bitching and moaning about? Come on, it's I'm easy. tough. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second time it hits you in the ass, and then what happened? Yeah, then I thought I was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, the first place was where? What? Where did you get it? First place I was in Bamako in Mali. Okay, and the second place? Second time I was in Angola, just outside Luanda. Okay, all the way down south there. Yep. Huh. You wouldn't think, that, well, you mean, maybe you got them bitten when you were in the Congo. Maybe in the Congo, or I'd hung out in Luanda for like a week in, in you know, capital cities, tons of people. And I do remember one night getting bitten quite a few times. And then mm. it was kind of like a week after that that I got sick. So I won. Yeah, because usually, usually, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I would think that it's you're a bit safer in the cities because they have fewer um, places where water is still and, and you know, they it drain. But if, if it's the rainy season, even in a city, it could become infested. Yeah, and I just, I felt like they were worse simply because there's so many people, which means the small mosquitoes in general, just kind of everyone's yeah. crammed in. Yeah, it could be. Could be. I mean, you, you should know from the Yukon, I think there in the summertime, it's like Mosquito City, right? Yeah, now. they'll pretty much pick you up and carry you away if you're not careful. Exactly. Yeah. And they're big fucking mosquitoes. They the mosquitoes are. in Africa are these little, little shits. Yeah. And you don't even know you're getting bitten until hours exactly. later. And then you're like, right. crap. Right. Yeah. And that's what makes them both uh, nice and not so nice in the sense that when you get bitten by a mosquito in the Yukon, you will feel that welt for days That's and you right. will be scratching and itching it for days in africa if you get bitten after a few hours it's not that itchy anymore exactly right unless you get malaria <laughs> and then suddenly everything goes to shit. right but you don't get, feel itchy no i guess not you just itchy. feel like you're gonna die you just feel like you're gonna die <laughs> so now when i'm in the yukon now and i get bitten i try to be all zen about it and i'm like this is okay i'm not getting malaria don't worry That's about true. it true yeah. I wonder if there was a time, I don't know if you know about the history, about whether there was a period where the a big, giant Alaskan and Arctic mosquitoes, did they have malaria at one time? Because I know malaria was endemic in the United States. Yeah, like Florida and the Carolinas and stuff used to have malaria for sure. Correct. And I think even further north, a little bit further north than that as okay. well. But yeah. I don't know if it ever got as far north as Canada. Yeah, I Probably have no not. idea. I kind of yeah. would assume the winter would take care of it, but but I don't know. Well, I you know, I see what you mean by just ki killing the plasmodium itself. Yeah, but I, I have no idea. Yeah, interesting. Okay, and so um, you went, you hung out in Mali for yep. uh, what three or six months? Sorry, like two months. Two months, sorry. And then from there, um, you had a great time, and they have a, a they have a famous music scene and all that stuff. Absolutely, sure. yeah, it was great. Yeah. yeah. I didn't actually go to Mali, uh, Bamako, but um, it was it was uh, good. And Guinea uh, is 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 nice because of the mountains, and you probably oh, got to see some of those. I loved Guinea; it was one of my favorite countries. Yeah, no, it's it's spectacular. Yeah. Okay, and then from there you drove down to Cote d'Ivoire. Did you go to Yamasukuro, the capital? I did go to Yamasukuro, yeah, and I went to the big basilica. You know, so I'll tell you a funny story. I didn't even know the big basilica existed when I was driving through. And so for those who don't know, and probably most people don't know, Mali has a basilica that's bigger, I think by a couple of meters than the one in the Vatican. Am I right? Yeah. They say it's the world's biggest Catholic monument. Correct. And so I didn't even know that. And I just went there and I was like, holy shit, what the fuck is this thing doing here in the middle of a sleepy capital? Because by the way, Yamasukuro, is, as for those who haven't been there, it's a sleepy capital. And yet I went there and I was like, my goodness, this massive basilica church that just goes on and on. They spent the equivalent of, in today's dollars, probably a billion dollars building that thing. And they got themselves severely in debt. There's a whole story about that anyway. Um, but you did get to actually go inside of it, did you? I did, yep. Okay, great. Yeah, and you're right. It's completely mind-bending and doesn't make any logical sense. <laughs> Why the pre I mean, the president was stroking his own ego, I guess. He wanted right. to Right. He was from Yamasukuro. This, right, and he wanted to have this big monument to his own superiority or something. He had a small cock is what it is. You know, <laughs> that's the reality of it. I'm know. not going to say that because if I ever go back no, to Ivory I saw Coast, it. I saw I it. I, I don't want there. 
I don't want his heavies to come after me, so I'm not going to say anything nasty about him. I saw the autopsy. I've been there. I've seen it. He has a small penis. Trust me. Okay. Um, and so he built this big, giant monument to himself. And then he, from there, um, yeah, he got the whole country in, in massive debt. But overall, the guy was a pretty good leader. I think, yeah, you could, I think he did all right. You can you could definitely do a lot worse by African leader standards. That's right. That's right. Okay. And so from there, um, we continue on and you went to Burkina Faso. Now, were you there? Because you, right soon after I left Burkina Faso, I started another CIA kind of uh, coup. You know, I started that protest in the street. I, I was behind all that. But actually, so were, was there protests going on when you went to Burkina Faso? There weren't any protests, no. And Is been... it after you left? It must have been after I left because there'd been like a kidnapping maybe six months earlier or a bombing mm -hmm. in um, the capital, Ouagadougou, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. there wasn't protests while I was there, no. Okay. So then it, maybe it happened just after? Yeah. Or yeah, I'm not sure. It must sure. have happened like immediately after because I felt embarrassed, Dan, when I left Burkina Faso because I spent, I don't know, at least a month or two months there, something like that. And I felt that that everything was dandy and things were fine. And then yep. soon after I left, I, less than a year, they erupted all these protests in the street because the president had declared that he wants to have a, a thick a third term or a fourth term, right. you know, change the constitution like they sure, often Sure, he do. doesn't, doesn't want to give up power, <laughs> usual story. Correct. And then this time it erupted in protests in the street and I was embarrassed because I never saw it coming while I was there. I didn't yep. sense any formant in the streets and any kind of like people whispering about this whole, you know, thing like if that president tries to extend his term, we're going to rise up. None of that. So I missed it. And I guess you completely missed it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Africa is interesting like that in that people, they don't like to speak out against, you know, their chief of the village or their tribal leader or the president. They kind of, because he is the big man, it's like you have to respect him and you have to follow him. And so I think most people do that kind of for a really, really long time until eventually something happens and then they snap and then they're like, now it's time for a coup. Now we have to kick this guy out. But kind right. of even like a week before a coup, everything feels fine. You wouldn't even know that like people are sort of hitting their limit. Right, right. Mm. It's fascinating. Did you skip Ghana? I did skip Ghana. Do, what do you not like English speakers? What's your problem, dude? They wouldn't give me a visa. Fucking ass. Oh, yeah. You know why? Because you didn't, you have to get it from your home country. Right? Exactly. They, they make that rule really strict where every embassy I went to, they're like, no, nah, we're not going to talk to you. Go to your home country. So one of the only intelligent things I did during my trip to Africa was somehow, because I didn't really look at too many websites and do any research before I would go to countries. And somehow I had a few neurons in my brain <laughs> that were alerting me to like look ahead. So when I was in Dakar in Senegal, somehow I found out that the Ghanaian embassy in Dakar is the only embassy in West Africa that is pretty lenient about that rule. And Perfect. just to, for those who, who don't know what we're talking about is that there are some countries, approximately five countries in Africa that insist that you get the visa to their country from your home country and they will not issue you a visa. So let's say you want to go to the DRC and you're sitting in Cameroon. The Cameroon embassy will not issue you a visa for the DRC. They'll tell you to go to Washington, D.C. or wherever your home country is. And like I said, five countries do this, and one of them is Ghana. Yeah. And I somehow had the prescient notion of getting that visa from Ghana when I was in Dakar. Perfect. And... Now hearing your woes, it sounds like you did not go to Dakar. I did not go to Dakar, no. I, I mean, you went to Dakar, so you didn't go to the embassy. Right, right. I started trying to get that visa, I think. I tried in Conakry, I tried in Bamako, and I tried in Ouagadougou, and all of them said, go to your home country. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, I did the same strategy with Algeria, because Algeria has that same policy. Okay. And I went, I started, I don't know, in. I tried in... Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. I tried again in Rwanda. Yep. And then I tried again, I can't remember what other country. And then finally it was in Chad, in in Jemena, the capital of Chad, yep. that finally I found a Algerian consul who was understanding of the story that I had, which is, well, 
I'm not going back to, I haven't been to my home country in years. Yep. I'm not planning to go back for a few years. I need a visa, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so it, uh, unfortunately, those are really hard to find those sympathetic ears. Yeah, and I think it's it's a question of perseverance. And so, you know, Nigeria, I had to find a way to get it. You know, you can't do the trip without getting Nigeria. So I just, I persevered until I got it. But Good Ghana, point. Ghana was kind of, you know, once I looked on a map, I'm like, oh, I can just skip it. It's not a big deal. Right, right, yeah. yeah. No, I understand. Um, but it's still very frustrating. And I, I, I could be, I know that Nigeria has loosened up its policies. It changes month to month right now. They're being pretty painful again. They're forcing people to get a police escort to the airport from the border of Togo. And then when you're at the airport, they'll issue you a visa, you know, kind of using all the computers and everything they have at the airport. But apparently it's, it's a right pain in the neck. That sounds so Nigerian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> God, let's make anything that could be simple. Let's make it more complicated. Yeah, more paperwork, um, more bribes, yeah. more people involved. Exactly. Yeah. So very frustrating. But um, but but Nigeria is improving overall their visa thing. Yes, uh, especially with regard to other Africans visiting them because mm. they used to make it very difficult for other African countries to visit Nigeria. Okay. And now they are moving, believe it or not, to an giving a visa to all Africans. Ah, interesting. Upon arrival. Yep. So I think once they do that, they'll realize that Europeans and Americans and Australians are not are also pretty safe bets. Yeah. And they're not really dying to to immigrate to Nigeria and stealthily sneak yeah. in their country and do lots of business there. Yeah. Um, and steal jobs from hardworking Nigerians. <laughs> so once they realize that, they'll say, OK, well, I guess this might actually help our tourism a tiny bit. Yep. and let's yep. loosen up these controls but it once again goes back to what i was saying earlier which is the hardest part about africa or the, the the most frustrating part is the visa process definitely and i think what a big difference too is when you fly into the airports lots of countries have visa on arrival now but crossing the land borders they still don't understand what that means or you know they don't have computers at the land borders so they can't do any of that stuff they sometimes don't have electricity that's right yeah so so mm -hmm. land borders are usually a different story than if you land like in the capital city at the airport the flip side, though, Dan, and you probably would agree with this, I'm guessing, is that the advantage of land borders is that they sometimes have a lot more flexibility, especially a small land border. That's right. I felt like they had ultimate flexibility. You could, If you were patient and friendly and polite, you could pretty much negotiate anything you wanted to. And if you had a few extra bucks in your hand? Yeah, I tried really hard never to pay. That was kind of one of my rules. Really? Yeah, don't You pay. are such a Boy Scout. <laughs> no, I'm, Boy Scout I'm, no I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose. But I mean, it, it's, it's sometimes, it's just so exhausting. They, they really do have all the time in the world. And, and usually I had all the time in the world. I remember one time in Burkina Faso, I was leaving. My, my visa had expired. And so I should have paid for a new visa, but I just waited them out. I waited three hours and finally said, ah, oh, just fuck it, get out of our country, yeah. leave. Yep. Um, but, but sometimes the problem is, is when I've actually done something wrong or I need something, like I need a visa, I'm prepared to pay for that visa. And they may say, well, we can't issue you one. And then that's when I got a bribe. I guess I, I need something. That's right. Desperate yeah. When, enough. when they kind of have you in a sticky situation, that's when like they hold all the power and that's when, right. yeah, bribing kind of becomes an option. Dan, how much time did you spend in Togo? I wasn't in Togo very long. I'm going to say like a week, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. So that's roughly the same amount of time I spent there. And it's, uh, I feel ashamed because that was the one country I actually want to spend a lot more time in because nobody's ever fucking heard of Togo. Right. So I wanted to become the world's expert in Togo. <laughs> and unfortunately, I did, a one week is just not going to get you there. No, no. And I really liked it. It was, it was a lot cleaner and more organized than, you know, the bordering countries. And people were really friendly. People were upbeat. I thought, it, you know, it has a really bright future ahead of it. So it seemed well, like did you nice find place. any, who are the cocksuckers in Africa? I mean, did you find any people who are really difficult? No, I, well, I had a rough go in Ethiopia. Um, okay. But no, I never found any people that were horrible. But, you know, for example, in Benin, right next to Togo, I just felt like it was extremely dirty and run down and, you know, it just didn't feel kind of as vibrant or as happy. It kind of felt more like drudgery, just in comparison. Mm. I mean, people were still friendly, 
but it just didn't seem to be kind of as well organized or as well put together. Okay. Yeah. So there, there were that was one of because in general, I mean, I'm sure you would agree that in Africa, people are extremely friendly. Oh, out of this world, friendly and happy and vibrant, and just like yeah. shrug their shoulders and get on with being happy because what else are you going to do? So, but but there's plenty of reasons I guess they could be miserable, but. For you, the places that you found a little bit of on the other side of the spectrum of friendliness, you would say it was in Benin, maybe a little bit less friendly and maybe and of course your Ethiopia experience. Yeah, and even I wouldn't say Benin was less friendly, more like just the country itself, you know, kind of dirty and not organized com okay, compared yeah. to Togo. And it was like such a stark difference to drive from Togo into Benin. It felt like I'd driven into a different world. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't, didn't find it, you know, you're talking about from Lome to um, Cotonou? Yeah. Okay, interesting, because I didn't notice that big of a difference. Oh, I would okay. say, I would agree with you, but uh, yeah, I didn't see like, wow, I do, you know, I do remember there was a gleaming kind of skyscraper. I mean, it wasn't very tall skyscraper, maybe about 10 stories in Togo. Yeah. In Lome, there yeah. was a nice shiny thing and they had this long beach. Yeah, and Lomé has like really clean streets and like reasonably sane traffic and kind of, you know, good roads and stuff. Mm. And then I drove into Cotonou and it was just like crumbling and there was yeah. trash, you know, knee deep on the sidewalk. Yeah. Mm. Although trash in Africa is pretty common. Yeah, pretty hard to get away from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then from there you you struggle where did you finally or how did you finally get your nigerian visa because again one of the challenges that people like you who are overlanding um is that you get to, you got to get these visas as you go you can't be sitting in australia or canada and then say well in about two and a half years time i'm gonna be in nigeria entering by this border at this crossing at this time <laughs> exactly right so it's it becomes this huge big logistical game of like where am i going to get all the visas um and there's quite a network now of overlanders who are driving West Africa, not a ton of people, but kind of enough that share information about where you can get which visa. What is your favorite website for getting that information? Uh, iOverlander is really good these days. It's actually- Did you say iOverlander? Yes. And it's, okay. it's an app for cell phones, but it also has a website component. And it's okay. crowdsourced data about like, where are the embassies, where are the borders, where are the campgrounds, stuff like that. So it has, it has really good information put in by real travelers, like real overlanders. Um, so I had a pretty good list of where to get all the visas. And at the time, the embassy in Bamako in Mali was known to issue Nigerian visas. Um, and it took, it took just over a week to get it, but they did give me one. And you know, they asked a ton of questions and I had to go back there multiple times, but in the end it worked. So that, In that Bamako? Was, in Bamako, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And my and backup so was way for that, ahead of your way ahead of getting there. Yeah, that's right. But it was really good because they give you six months to enter. Good. And then, and then your visa is valid for one month from whatever day you happen to enter. So that's, I love it when they do it. That oh, way. I know. It was so oh. nice. Yeah. yeah. The worst are the people who say, well, your visa is starting today and that's ends in one month. I'm exactly. like, fuck you. And it's like three countries away. And you're like, <laughs> exactly, what, what am right. I going to do with that? We're giving you a one week visa and it's starting now and yeah. it's going to take you about 10 days to get there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would always negotiate so hard on those ones. Like Sudan did that actually. And I was like, no, 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 that's not. And so I just negotiated. Sudan, like, one of the biggest countries in the world. Yeah, I just negotiated. <laughs> we're going to give you like a two day visa. An hour until eventually they were like, okay, you can have a one month visa instead of a one week visa. And I'm like, okay, that's good. And I'm like, and I don't want it to start until a month from now. And they were like, what? And so I just yeah. round and around and around and like pulled out a map of Africa and showed them my trip and showed them my book. And then they were like, okay, whatever. And the dude just like changed it in my passport and was like, get out of here. <laughs> Did he like just bust out a pen and scribble it out? Yeah. He got out uh, what do you call that stuff? Correction ink, like the white, uh, oh, white out I stuff. love this. Yeah. So in my See, passport. This is a criminal like me loves this shit. I know. I would just bust out the same little correction ink and do it myself and well, just was, say it was the ambassador who did it <laughs> i was worried i thought when i got to the border they were going to give me a hard time about it they didn't say a word they didn't care <laughs> no exactly no. it's so beautiful i love it <laughs> and the best ones are like the small borders that's oh. when just nobody really pays attention or cares they have no electricity or that's computers right. they can't check you that's right and so yeah. it's just like i thought it was great. always better to go to small borders for that reason yes and like nobody's stressed nobody's yelling at anybody you just show up and be like, oh, hey guys, how are you? Nice to meet you, nice day. Like, and, and someone's like, oh, everyone's away on lunch. I'm like, 
oh, no problem. Like, I'll go and have lunch as well. Like, just, just be like really easy going. And then right. when they get back from lunch, they're happy to stamp your stuff and be like, see ya. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. might take a little bit longer sometimes, but it's ah. it's worth it. Yeah, I've got nowhere to be. No big deal. So I'm looking, maybe I'm reading too much into your map, Dan, no, but no. I'm looking at around the Cameroon yeah. and there's yep. like a like a circle yep. of some sort, like you're going around in circles there. Yep, I did exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> you just went to Cameroon to drive around in circles. <laughs> Pretty much. Yep. That's exactly what I did. <laughs> so you're admitting to the world that you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm uh, bad at planning and I make stuff up. Or you don't know how to drive. Or your your car was stuck in the yes. circle. <laughs> I couldn't turn. That's All right. Okay, so give us a story. What what happened? You know, Cameroon has that mountainous region. Um, what do they call that? The something mountains of the, the ring road in the mountains. Yeah, the ring road. Yeah. Around Bamenda. Yeah, and so yeah. I just wanted to explore. Bamenda, by the way, for those who don't know, is the English-speaking Anglophone region. Right. And so I just wanted to look around. So I drove. Yeah, I really did drive in a circle so I could see everything in that area. Got it. Yeah. Now, what about when you went there was the the separatists in Cameroon, which are trying to create a country called Ambazonia. Was any of that fermenting and starting there or was that after you left? I drove right into the middle of all of it. Um, the government had cut off the Internet. And... So wait, you started it. <laughs> yeah. You're the fucking Anglophone that went in there and started it. Well, actually, I was traveling with a German couple and that, the people of Cameroon were asking the Germans to help them because they're like, hey, you, you colonized us in the first place. We want you to come back and colonize us again and help us because we'd rather have <laughs> German masters than deal with these French a-holes. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty wild. Well, and, and, and they didn't say that. They said, well, you're, what about your British brothers? No, they, they asked for the Germans. They didn't ask that, for the British. Exactly right. They asked for the Germans. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I would ask for the Germans too. They're, they know how to run countries, you know? And so it was, it was pretty touchy actually. When we drove into Bermenda, um, it was like three days before Cameroon's Independence Day. But of mm. course, the people in that region didn't want to celebrate because they were, you know, they're sick of Cameroon. So actually, the government was sending in like hundreds of soldiers and they were going to force people to celebrate at gunpoint. Literally, they were going to point guns at them until they started celebrating. That's what I'm going to do on my birthday. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the beatings will continue until morale improves. It's like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was a bit touchy, actually. And, and we had a bit of an incident where the, the military came into our camp at night and uh, got us out of the vehicles and they weren't happy with us at all. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. But it worked, so out. From, it worked out fine. Now, you went to Gabon. Gabon is a country, again, that you need to get your visa from your home country. Yeah. But Gabon that... was one I organized a long way ahead as well. You're a very smart man. Um, so that uh, has also, by the way, recently changed in the last year or so where yep. they've, they've kind of loosened that up. I think, I don't know if it's visa on arrival or it's an automatic. Anyway, it's something like that. They've, they've gotten a little bit better. They're all so. getting slightly better now. Correct. Yep. And that is great news for the continent and for those who don't live on the continent, for That's everybody. Right. Exactly, yep. It's fantastic news. Okay, so then you went to, to Gabon. Yep. And... And uh, Liberville is a beautiful capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved Gabon, one of my favorite mm -hmm. countries. And then from there, you went to the Republic of Congo. You That's right. dropped, dropped down into Brazzaville. We talked about the crossing uh, just downstream on the Congo River, uh, downstream of Kinshasa and Brazzaville. Yep. And then you got into Luanda, capital of Angola, which then you got your malaria, <laughs> yep. which nearly knocked you out. Exactly. How bad How bad did it get? Like, did your fever, do you remember how your temperature was? Oh, I, I was just like on the side of the road with my friends. I didn't go to a clinic or anything. So I, what? So I didn't have, oh, well, we had, um, we had the injectable version of the medicine. We had Artithum with us. So my friends were giving me a needle in my butt twice a day. Um, but I didn't have like a thermometer or anything. So I don't know how high my fever was. Uh, but it was oh, bad. Goodness. It was Why bad. didn't you just go to a clinic? Well, we were like 200 miles from a clinic and I couldn't drive. And wow. I don't know, staying put just seemed like the right thing to do. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Fascinating. Okay. And yep. then from there, you 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 went down to Windhoek into Namibia, which That's was... Right. By, um, and then you your original plan was to do what most people do, which is go straight down to South Africa. But you decided to go east into Botswana. Yep. Uh, and you went to the Capri, uh, the Caprivi Capri Strip. Yep. Cap Caprivi Strip. Thank you. Yep. For those who don't know, which probably most people don't know, the Caprivi Strip is, if you look closely at a map of Namibia, you'll see in the northeast corner a spear like thing sticking out and st stabbing Botswana effectively, and I guess Angola. 
um, and it's part of Namibia, but it's just jutting out through there. And I suppose you know the story behind that Caprivi strip? I can make it up. I remember it has something to do with, is it Zambia wanted access to the coast? And so they needed to just be bordered by one country, not by two, something like that. That's a good story. And in some ways it is somewhat correct. From <laughs> what my understanding is, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm right, is that the British wanted to get a, or sorry, the Germans, sorry. Is it the Germans or the British? Now I'm all fucked up. In that um, part of <clears> Africa, <throat> I'd guess British, but I don't know. No, but I think it's the Germans actually, because I could, but maybe it's the, uh, I think it's the Germans who want to connect Tanzania and Namibia. Oh. And so that was one of the ways that they were kind of on their way to connecting the two countries because oh. they were both German at some point. Okay, yeah, that makes uh, sense. Prior to World War One. If it's not that story, then it's the British who were trying to connect to do their Cape Town to Cairo kind of thing. Um, but anyway, so the, what I'm 90% sure is that it's a colonizer who wanted to connect, I think, Namibia with Tanzania. Yeah, it, and I, so they, they were kind of like making their way and they traded a lot of money or land in order to get that Caprivi strip. Yeah, yeah, it sounds right to me that they, they needed that because it guaranteed Namibia access to more countries because otherwise it was going to be blocked by Botswana. I mean Zambia. Or Botswana, oh, if, oh, okay. if Botswana had have just extended oh. north until it hit the border of Angola. I see, I see, I see, yeah. okay. By the but, way, I'm sorry for those who are listening who can't follow along with the map. I guess they need a map to follow along. But, um, okay, and then from there you did all sorts of crazy shit in Botswana. How long did you spend in Botswana? Uh, about a month. Okay. Yeah. And you did you do any safaris? Because uh, I imagine you're... I went into a bunch of the big national parks, and because I had my own Jeep, I just drove myself around. But, yeah, okay. went into, like, the Okavango Delta and um, Moremi and Central Kalahari and... I mean, they are just stunning. Like, I, I can't wait to go back there. Some of the most beautiful parts of Earth I've ever seen in my whole life. Super friendly people, super wild places, like breathtaking. And why did you go from Namibia to Botswana as opposed down to South Africa? I, it was kind of a timing thing. I was having a friend fly into Johannesburg and just trying to organize how do I get to see as much of Southern Africa as possible without doing too much backtracking. And at the, at the time, that just made sense. So that's what I did. Okay. Fair does, it, does it actually make sense? Maybe not, but oh well, that's what no, I no, did. No, 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 it does make yeah. sense. It totally makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and then from there, you seem to have spent at least a month, if not two months, in South Africa. Yeah, it was. I think it was like eight weeks between South Africa and Lesotho I went into on five different occasions. Yeah. And what did you think of South Africa? South Africa is a very difficult place. I feel bad about saying it but i didn't particularly enjoy it um i don't think it's doing very well right now i think you know there's a lot of deep-seated hatred there's a lot of racism on both sides of the fence um and they're in for a really tough time i think because you know the white people treated black people horrendously bad for decades like worse than i ever imagined possible and now the black people kind of saying well now it's your turn like you get what you deserve Right. No, I think you summed it up so well. I agree with you 100% on everything. And it's fascinating. I didn't even prompt you like to try to like uh, bias your answer at all. I just asked you, what did you think? Yep. Open-ended. And you came up with an answer that I would have said word for word the same things effectively. It's, yep. it's uh, difficult. a total shame. It is real. And it's beautiful. And there are a ton of friendly people. And, you know, it, it's trying really hard. But there's a lot of, lot of deep-seated anger and hatred there that's going to be really hard to deal with. Do you think that the future bodes well for South Africa in the next 20 years? Or do you think, in other words, will they be able to get around that? I really hope so. I really hope they can find a way to work together. But while I was there, I, I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah. No, I was trying to imagine. I figured that it, would, it felt like, even though I wasn't born at that time, um, but when the 1965 mid 1960s in the united states was the civil rights revolution yeah. when all of a sudden blacks um became it, granted they were emancipated 100 years before 1965 but right it was in 1965 when all of a sudden a lot of the laws that were against them started to loosen up and there was 
um, but and desegregation was happening and things like that. But I imagine it was similar where this kind of intense hatred and it's and here we are in 2020. And still, there's a lot of racial tension yes. between blacks and whites in the United States. Even though we went, we got rid of our apartheid back in 1965 because we had it until then. Yep. And then the 19, and, and so to me, that smells like, okay, well, South Africa is going to have 50 years to get over not just one generation. They need two, maybe three. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. The so, only difference in the, the, the whole dynamic is the fact that the blacks in South Africa are the majority versus in America. They're, the, they are they're only the huge, 12%. They're the huge majority in South Africa. Yeah. Yeah. They're about 80% or 80, maybe 85. Yeah. I think it's 85. Somewhere. It's high. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so as a result, uh, in some ways, I remember reading a book by an Indian woman from South Africa, Indian descent. She's South African, but anyway, and she, it was the title of the book is "What Would Happen If All the Whites Left South Africa." Yep. Very provocative title. Yep. Um, and unfortunately, she doesn't really answer it with black and white answer, like a very clear answer. But she does speak about this idea of like the black South Africans often use similar arguments that the black Americans, the African Americans, if you're black Americans, use. And she, as a kind of, I guess you could call it objective, you know, she's Indian, Indian descent in South Africa, kind of just look, she's neither white, she's neither black. And she was like, she didn't get it. She was like, wait, mm. um, you know, it's a different story because here in Africa, now they have, in South Africa, the blacks actually have the political power. They may yep. not have all the economic power, which is their point, which is, well, the whites still control the money. And there's a lot of truth to that. Yep. But, um, but they felt that, but they're using some of the same victimization narrative that is easier to justify in the United States than it is in South Africa when the political power rests solidly in the black majority. Yep. And, and I just thought, huh, that, that there's a lot of truth to that. And I just couldn't see how South Africa is going to get themselves out of that mess. That's exactly how I felt as well. I, I don't even know what the path forward looks like. It's really, really difficult. And meanwhile, there's there's a white flight um, going on. First of all, white yep. people in South Africa have fewer babies than the blacks. And so as a result, even if they were not to emigrate, to leave, even if that were, were the case, they'd be going down a hundred years ago 20 percent of south africa was white 20 percent oh, wow. one yep. in five was white yep today it's about eight percent yep um and it's been steadily declining ever since they got their independence in 1994. yep so whew, that's a it's a heavy topic and it uh, is very heavy and it's it was always really, really amazing to drive from South Africa either into Lesotho or Swaziland or Botswana, any of the neighboring countries. And within five minutes, you could just breathe a huge sigh of relief because those countries, they're not like that. They don't have that same racial tension. And immediately yeah. you just feel safer and happier and more welcome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, day and night. 100% um, agree. As they say in South Africa, 100%. <laughs> and they say shame all the time. Anyway, so... Okay, and then let's go on to happier lands, yep. which is Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Yep. Well, Zimbabwe is not much happier. <laughs> it's got its slew of issues. Yeah, and I was but... I was there at an interesting time too. They they kicked out Mugabe about three months before I got there in the coup, okay. and, but they yeah. hadn't yet had the election where they voted in, oh, right. um, what's his name, Manangagwa? Yeah, Manangagwa. Yeah, yeah, who was his right-hand man and who was just as bad as Mugabe was. Right. Yeah. And he's still there. He's still there, yeah. 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 Still ruining the country, still driving it into the ground. Um, yeah. But, you know, I loved Zimbabwe more than any other country. I thought about actually staying, like I could live there. Mm. Never once in my six weeks did I hear a single person complain about anything. Zimbabweans mm. have the most amazing positive attitude, the most like, let's just find a way anyway. And they have this saying, let's make a plan. It's like, there's no gas in the gas station, there's no money in the ATM, <laughs> there's no food in the supermarket. But we all want to go camping this weekend. All right, let's make a plan. Make a plan. We'll, we'll find a way. It's like, what are you talking about? And, and they would do it. And they would do it with a smile on their face. 
Amazing. Yeah. Did you go to Mozambique twice? Uh, no, just oh, the no. once. Okay, got it. Okay, so that, it wasn't clear on the map, but, but yeah, I can see you just went to Malawi. Okay. Yep. So from there, uh, Zambia. Yep. Um, and then Malawi, and then into Tanzania. That's right. <clears throat> and then you went to hot, hot Dar es Salaam. I did go to Daha, which, yeah, was interesting, and across to Zanzibar for a couple of nights. That was fun. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, uh, but then you just left your, your Jeep, obviously, on the mainland. In I did, yep. All right. And then from there, you cut across to go to um, Burundi and Rwanda. That's right. Which were, I imagine, you enjoyed? Yeah, Burundi was great. It felt exactly like being back in West Africa. It felt like the Congo, and I loved it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, French speaking, kind of less developed, really friendly, really raw. And it was great. Right. I loved it. Yeah. And then Uganda. Yep. And then Kenya. Mm -hmm. And then then your woes began in Ethiopia. You kind of alluded to that earlier. What uh, exactly happened in Ethiopia that kind of was left a sour taste in your mouth? Ethiopia, it's one of those countries, I think, that changes rapidly. And so although I didn't have a great time, I know plenty of people love it and list it as their favorite country. So right. I wanted to start with that. But yeah. when I was there, like the new president sort of hasn't been in power very long. And she's giving lots of people power to like, finally, you're allowed to talk badly about the president. Like that's not illegal anymore. You, you know, you have all these new freedoms. And so I think a lot of people were kind of acting up on that and they were kind of playing out this idea we can do what we want. And for a lot of people that kind of meant behaving badly to tourists. And so I never experienced any direct violence, but very close to it. Uh, and friends of mine were attacked. Other overlanders were attacked at the same time. We met a guy on a bicycle who was almost beaten to death. Um, yeah, so it, it just wasn't, it didn't feel like a happy place to be. And then on top of that, even when I was in national parks and things, the, the people I was dealing with were just angry at me and just like yelling at me, even though I was paying the money to be inside their national park. Um, so it just didn't really feel like they were in a place to be accepting tourists. Like they, How many weeks were you there? Uh, about three weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on top of that, to, to cap it all off, at the time, there was lots of fighting going on between the tribes of Ethiopia, who were all near the borders, and the Ethiopian military, who were trying to reclaim all this territory that the previous president gave away. So the border between Kenya and Ethiopia was literally a war zone. I met people who like saw dead bodies in the street and got shot at and all of that. So it was sketchy getting into Ethiopia. Then the border to Djibouti was the same thing. That was sketchy. And then the border to Sudan was even worse. There was like many people killed and lots of burnt out vehicles and houses. And so Ethiopia did, didn't feel safe and it didn't feel like I was welcome at all. Interesting. Mm. Interesting. Um, fascinating. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so from there, you mentioned Djibouti, which yep. I felt was the hottest part of Africa. And I was there in the winter and it still maybe was the hottest part of Africa. <laughs> I, I kept telling people like, I don't know how you do it. It's so hot. And they were like, what do you mean? This is nothing. It's, it's was only... it like December or something? Uh, it must have been. Yeah, it was. It was or January. It was like first week of January. And that, so they, they so were lucky. like, it's, it's only 105. Like, this is nothing. This is, <laughs> don't even talk about this. Come back in the summer. It'll be like 130 every day. It really, and the thing that kills you in Djibouti is that it's also humid. Yeah. It's very humid in yeah. the, at least the time I was. Yeah. When I was there, it was as well. And it was, it's hard to take, isn't it? It's, it's in front yeah. yeah, it is. But I okay, loved so... it. That was, that was one of the most uh, like Martian landscapes I've ever seen in my life. Djibouti right. Did you go stunning. to the lowest point of Africa? I did. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's and I went out Lake to Lake Asal. Um, that's right. Yeah. And also out to Lake Abbey, which is kind of the volcanic region, which has these mm. crazy rock formations. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you decided to just avoid Somaliland because a lot of people actually go to Somaliland. You know, I looked into Somaliland and I was really tempted, um, but it was going to require a double entry visa to Djibouti and or Ethiopia. And it just logistically started. But wait, to... you had a double entry visa for Ethiopia because you had to go to Djibouti and out of Djibouti. That's a funny story. I didn't have a double entry visa. They wouldn't give me one. And then when I was in uh, Addis Ababa, I tried to convert my single entry into a double entry. And they said it might take three weeks and they might not be able to do it. So that was silly. So in the end, I actually drove into Djibouti with no way to get back to Ethiopia. And then, so I'm like shitting myself. I go yeah, down. Yeah, you're taking a big gamble there. I was. It could have ended your trip. It could have ended my trip. So I go. You would have had to put your thing on a boat and then maybe go up to Sudan's uh, 
Port Sudan up there. I kind of had a backup plan talking about your criminal dealings with your passport. I had a yes. plan, but but anyway, so I go racing into the embassy, but it was uh, Friday, whatever day is their weekend that isn't out. It was Friday, I think, because that's their weekend. And so they're like, oh no, the embassy's closed. You'll have to come back on like Monday. So I had to like shit myself for the weekend thinking I can't get back into Ethiopia. Finally go into the embassy, like pretty much ready to beg. Can I please have a visa? The guy behind the counter is like, oh, whatever, like, Fill this form out. Oh, yeah, it's $30. Okay, stamp, stamp. See you later. <laughs> like, uh, it was easy. <laughs> so I just got yeah. a, another single entry visa for Ethiopia. Just like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. But <laughs> all I, that stress for nothing. I think my backup plan was going to be okay because when I left Ethiopia, I really befriended the immigration guy, you know, and he knew that I had just come from Ethiopia. He knew I was coming back. My plan was basically just go to him and just be like, hey, dude, I was here like five days ago. And you saw him again? Yeah, it was him again. Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, that was Very kind of my backup plan. plan. Yeah, that, that is a smart plan. Uh, good <laughs> well, job. It's the only and one then, I had. <laughs> exactly. And then from there, you got into Sudan. Now, Sudan, at that point, had they, they had not yet overthrown Bashir. No, I was there about two weeks before they overthrew Bashir. So they were. So you you were the plant there. Yeah. You... They were protesting in Khartoum big time. I was told to stay out of certain regions of town. They were like out okay. on the streets. But you did you you went to Khartoum anyway. Yep. Yep. Oh, in, okay. like where I was was fine. It was you yeah, know yeah. people were really friendly. Like some of the friendliest people I've ever met in my life. Instead. Once again, a very fascinating comment by you because I didn't put words in your mouth, but that's exactly how I felt. I felt that out of all the African nations, none was more hospitable than Sudan. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I, I need to, we need to be clear there. The other countries are very hospitable. Somehow Sudan manages to outdo them, which is, which is impressive. True, true. Yep. But I will say this, and I agree with you what you said. However, one thing that often happens in Africa is people are constantly begging you for money or objects or something or whatever. Yep. And it's a very take, take, take uh, situation where they're kind of sucking stuff out of you. However, in what made Sudan special for me was that it was the only African country, probably, that I was being given more than I was giving. In well, other words, that people were saying, I'm going to pay for this drink for you. I'm going to do this. Don't pay that. Do this. You know, I'm going to give you a ride for free or whatever it is. And that was truly unique in the continent. So now we've just done the same thing in reverse. You just said that without me prompting you because <laughs> exactly the same thing happened to me. You know, these, these dudes went out of their way to find me some bread because it was hard to find in the city and they refused to take my money. They would not let me pay for it. Yeah. Someone invited me for tea and lunch. Which and they... will almost never, ever happen on the rest of the continent. Right. No African in their right mind, you offer them money, it's very rare that they will refuse, especially after multiple attempts. That's right. Yep. It's very rare. Yep. They'll always say, oh, thank you. Yeah. And <laughs> I'll take it. And yep. uh, Yeah, I had people buy lunch for me. I had people buy coffee and tea for me, and they would refuse my money. It didn't matter how hard I tried. They just wouldn't take it. And I guess it's, I don't know, it's like a special Sudanese thing because you might be tempted to say it's like a Muslim thing, Muslim hospitality, but there's plenty of Islamic countries in Africa yeah. and they don't behave the same way. So it's not Islamic thing. No. And it's not a North African-ish thing because... Egyptians don't behave the same way. That's right. And and uh, Mauritanians well, didn't... weren't the same. Yeah, yeah, yep. exactly. So it's something. It's in the water of Sudan. I think it's drink... Sudanese it's, it's, people. What, hap are just... what happens is that the confluence of the White Nile and the Blue <laughs> Nile creates this water that's very special. That when you drink it, you become extremely generous. I'm that's sticking right. with that story. That's a good story. <laughs> yeah, that was unbelievable, wasn't it? How and you know they're putting up with such horrible conditions under Bashir but they still manage to be so kind and so generous. It's amazing. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. And, and when people ask me, where should I go visit in Africa that's off the beaten track, Sudan is often on the top of the list. Yeah, yeah, and it's stunningly beautiful too. Like the, yeah. the desert is just mind-blowing. It doesn't make sense. Did you get to see any of their pyramids? I did, yeah, yeah. I went to quite a few of them. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah just yeah, like camped right beside them. It was great. <laughs> great. No, yeah. that's is, it's spectacular. A lot of people don't realize that Sudan has so many pyramids. And so from there, you, you did that long, complicated border crossing in Egypt. Yep. And then eventually you drove along the Nile. Yep. To get to Cairo. 
<clears throat> and originally you had planned to go through Libya until I overthrew Gaddafi. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And I ruined your party again. You did. Um, and so did you kind of, at what point did you know that you were not going to be going through Libya? Um, it was probably back in Ethiopia. I, in Addis, I tried to get a visa for Libya and it just, there was just no universe, you know, they wouldn't even really talk to me. And then I started hearing from other travelers too, that there's the, the Western desert road in Egypt. I don't know if you know about it, it cuts through like the white desert and the black desert. Mm. It's a North to South road. That's like further West than the Nile. And it's, it's kind of the one and only. And right. right, or when I was there last year, the Egyptian military had orders to shoot anyone on site who was west of that road. So right. what that meant was there was a 0% chance the Egyptian military would even let me get to the Libyan border. Even if I had a valid visa, they wouldn't let me go there. Right. Um, the Egyptian military are really, really paranoid about white people getting you know, into trouble in their country. They really want to look after white people. So they basically yeah. don't let you drive anywhere that they think is dangerous. Yeah, although, yeah, I did go to the Sinai Peninsula at the time, and that was uh, interesting. But it, but you're right. In general, they they are kind of cautious. I, I really wanted to go to the Sinai, um, and because that was then my other plan. Instead of going across the top of Africa, I'd drive into Israel and ship out of there, so that at least I could kind of like drive off Africa, you know, finish Africa in that way. And the Sinai, when I was there a year ago, they had this really interesting rule. They didn't care if I went as a white person and got kidnapped. They're like, yeah, whatever, you can go. They wouldn't let me take my Jeep because they don't want the Jeep to get kidnapped and then used against them by the bad guys. What a ridiculous thing. <laughs> Apparently, if you ride a crappy motorbike or if you have like some crummy car, they'll let you go. Yeah. But in like well-equipped four-wheel drive, they won't let you drive across the Sinai. So, yeah. Wow. Who knows? Um, and then what about uh, in your future plans? Do you ever want to, I imagine there's, well, there's a lot of countries that you did leave out. I mean, you'd left out Chad and Niger and Central African Republic. Central absolutely. Yeah. I've South, heard... Sudan, South Sudan, you missed out on that uh, wonderful paradise. <laughs> yeah. I've heard the northern part of Chad is one of the most beautiful places on earth where the, the desert mm. has those big uh, sandstone formations. I, I climbed the tallest mountain of Libya, which is right on the Chad Libya border. Oh, wow. So those are the Tbilisi mountains. Wow. And, and you're right. It is truly uh, a wonderful alien landscape and is phenomenal yeah so you got to alexandria that's right yep that was... and then from there what happened to your you took your car and put it on a ferry i, I put it in a shipping container uh and i shipped it actually directly back to canada from there wow and and yep. that cost two thousand three thousand dollars yeah it was about three grand i think okay yep Wow. And then from there, you took a flight to eventually to Canada or you? That's right. Yeah. I flew through okay. Australia to visit family while the, because the, the shipping for that took about three and a half weeks, I think. So I mm -hmm. hung out in Australia and then flew to Canada. Now, how did, now your book that you've written, mm -hmm. uh, which again, to remind listeners, it's The Road Chose Me, part two, which is about his Africa trip, um, is you kind of like got it out really fast. Like you finished your trip in 2019. I finished, I, I finished my trip a year ago. I got back, well, I left Africa on March 10th. So almost exactly a year ago today. My birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you left on March 10th. Yep. And that was a year ago. Yep. But then your book has already come out. Or uh, it's like... It's it was, nearly you, finished. Yeah, I'm, I'm running a Kickstarter right now. So it's thank nearly Thank you. Done. So now now is your time to plug the Kickstarter. <laughs> so, yep, Kickstarter, The Road Chose Me, Volume 2. Uh you can get the book, you can get my other books, you can get stickers and patches and lots of goodies. And I will put links to his Kickstarter on the show notes. It's ending on what date in March? It ends on March 14th. So we have 10 March days 14th, from today. March 14th, 2020. Yes. Um, and so if this episode will release uh, soon, and that way people will have a few days to participate. What's the cheapest level of or what's the cheapest amount for them to just get the book if that's what they want Is yeah it 25 dollars uh yeah it's about 22 us dollars just for the book okay yeah and it's a and it's a limited edition version that has a uh, full color photos in the interior and that's so that's the idea of the kickstarter to get this limited edition printed at an affordable price right and so those uh at this point as we're recording this which is about two weeks to go what percentage 
you've 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 hit your goal i have actually hit my goal yeah so the kickstarter is definitely going ahead which is super exciting fantastic congratulations how much money have you thank uh, you how much what you know by the way i don't like to say money raising a lot of people talk about kickstarter as if it's a charity I'm right like, oh, it's not a fucking charity it's think of it as pre-sales you know exactly it's like, and it's hard it's too because the, the dollar amount that it's showing also includes postage and yes. and the printing costs and the taxes that i have to pay and the 20 percent i have to give to kickstarter so is it 20 percent? i thought it was 10 percent. it went up to 20. fuck you really <laughs> yeah dude yeah. that sucks 20 percent to kickstarter those greedy bastards um so yeah so right now i've raised Jesus. about ten thousand us which is great it means i can order a big enough batch currently it's about 160 people have pledged um but yeah i mean it's not like all of that's going in my pocket by any means yeah and that's the thing that pisses me off a lot of people are like i donated to your cause i'm like you didn't donate to the Kickstarter, no, you you're just getting a product. It. Exactly, yeah. you pre-bought it. You yeah. bought it. You you, you like pre-ordered. That's all you did. Yeah, and, that's right. And I appreciate that. I thank you for that. Yeah, you know, I love that. But let's not put you on a pedestal. You know, it's not like I'm. It's not like a GoFundMe campaign. GoFundMe campaigns, you're asking money for almost nothing. You know, I, like I have cancer, give me money, I can help my cancer treatment. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's, you know, and do it, you know, I can't afford to go to college, give me money, I'm going to go to college. Right. And that's that's true charity. Right. But most Kickstarters are giving you something for your money. Yeah. And that's yeah. just pre-ordering it. You're just, you're getting, a, you're an early adopter of the product, which is wonderful. And otherwise, it helps people uh it helps people do these things like you're like you're doing a limited edition color photos and that kind of stuff it, allowed, right. it couldn't be done otherwise or at least it'd be very expensive otherwise yeah, yeah. so and it is it is grateful but um so um don't think that dan is a beggar who's asking for charity he's just asking you to buy a product that he's made and has worked hard on and took years of travel to do and for just 22 bucks you can uh, learn about his crazy adventure to Africa. And if you spend nearly 50 bucks, I guess you'll get your other book, right? That's right. Yep. And then there's a photography book as well and some other stuff. Right. Yep. So, and now I imagine uh, the only way you can only, you can do this so quickly is you have to self-publish in order to make it happen. Otherwise publishers don't publish that fast. That's right. I'm self-publishing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, think it's the smart strategy to do unless you're some super famous right. person with a following of a million people of whatever um and a lot of people and, and that allows you to do this so quickly and that's the advantage and i'm embarrassed because i haven't finished my africa book and you finish your trip after me and you finished your book already i'm like <laughs> god i'm such a loser I'm a complete loser. Dan is like it the seems, man. Seems like you've got some other things on the go. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fucking loser. <laughs> Dan's the man. So um, I, I, I'm very, uh, I admire your diligence and your, that you just, so my question to you is like, were you writing on the road because pumping out a book in a year's time, that's almost impossible. Yeah, I was writing quite a bit on the road and I was keeping a journal. Um, and a lot of this stuff, it's, it's not only like the adventures I had and the misadventures I had, it's a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today about how, what are my feelings on Africa and what do I think about the situation in this country or what do I think about foreign aid or, you know, the media's perception of Africa. And, and a lot of that stuff I really needed to get down on paper to help me understand it and to help like get it off my chest. And so it actually, it's been really healthy for me to sort of like sit down and hammer it out and really like feel that I've released it. And now I'm, I'm really proud that I'm going to like let it out into the wild so that people can, I don't know, kind of see it through my eyes or have the same sort of perspective that I have now that I've been there for so long. I think I might want to read, I don't think, I know I would love to read your book because... I'm sure that you faced a big dilemma, which is what I'm facing. And one of the reasons I'm struggling so much with your book is that you have a pigmentation problem. I do. <laughs> You're white. Yes. And as a result, I wrote a book about Eastern Europe and I sometimes would criticize Eastern Europeans, make fun of them, do that kind of stuff and gave my honest, blunt opinion about Eastern Europe and nobody really batted an eye, even Eastern Europeans themselves. 
But I find myself doing the same thing with Africans because all countries have flaws and shortcomings and oddities and idiosyncrasies and yep, things yep. that irritate you, etc. But when you do that with black people, suddenly you are a fucking racist. And that makes white people gun shy about saying anything critical about Africa without knowing that the politically correct police is going to crucify you for your thoughts. That's right. How did you deal with that? It's been really hard for me, Francis, since I got back, because when I was in Africa, I mean, people would just walk up to me and say like, hello, white, like my name was LeBlanc, like the white, <laughs> but like, they're not being racist in any way. They're not right. being, they're just, they're just telling the truth. And so it became quite common that I could just call them black and like refer to them as black people not because I'm being criticizing or in any way degrading them, because like if someone called me tall, it just is a fact. I mean, the fact mm -hmm. is I have white skin and they have black skin and that's okay. And so throughout my three years in Africa, I became very like unpolitically correct. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sensitive anymore at all because I don't think it's hurting anyone just to sort of tell the truth or just call it what it is. Um, and so in my book, I, I just call it what it is. And it just is honest and it's genuine and if people want to say that it's not politically correct, I'm going to tell them they should go and spend a couple of years on the ground in Africa and then ask the Africans if they think it's unpolitically correct. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going, to, they're going to tell you that, no, it's not. It's just, this is just reality. Some people have white skin and some people have black skin. Well, not only that, but that I find that Africans are the most quick to agree with most of my criticisms of their continent and of their countries. And they whenever I would bring up these issues um, that any kind of criticisms I have had of, of their countries, they would be like, yeah, that's right. And, and it's the intellectuals that come out of Africa, maybe who the guys who go to Harvard or whatever. And then there's the, um, the white people, the people who, and some of them are working for NGOs and, 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 or who have never even been to Africa for that matter who are very protective of the way we characterize Africa yeah. and any kind of derogatory statements must be silenced. Right. And what are some of the controversial opinions that you have about the continent or things that, that the politically correct crowd would be bristling over? <laughs> um, I mean, there's a bunch. But I mean, first and foremost, I don't really think foreign aid is helping. I think mm. actually it does a lot of harm for the most part. I'm, I'm sure some of it is very is helpful and I'm sure, you know, well directed and well looked after. But that's mm. less than 5% of the overall. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of people would be annoyed to hear that. Um, right. And, and they certainly all, although Dambiza Moyo wrote that book, Dead Aid, and yeah. she she got quite a following. And then there's also The White Man's Burden written yep. by, uh, I forgot his name, um, that man, um, who also criticized uh, aid. Bill Gates, though, says that we need to distinguish between aid that either private organizations are doing that are helping like healthcare stuff, which is what the, found, the Gates Foundation is doing, versus government aid, which are helping to, let's say, prop up leaders or buy tanks or um, that kind of stuff. Right. And I don't know if you see that as being a distinction or or all aid is more or less anathema. Oh, no, I think, yeah, there's definitely a distinction and there's definitely a lot of nuances. But I think the, the bulk majority of money that's spent on aid is just about like uh, getting good coverage in the press. You know, hey, look what we did give us a gold star, let us, you know, print a nice colorful brochure so we can get more money and then move mm. on. It isn't, they're not actually trying to help. They're just trying to like give themselves props or, you know, be able to print a color brochure. So I think that's the biggest distinction I make. Do these people actually care about helping people on the ground or do they just care about like increasing their budget for next year and bringing in even more money next year? I'm going to need to talk with you again after I read your book because I'm fascinated. I just can't wait to read it. I will support you on your Kickstarter <laughs> Thank you. and get, get, you, uh, get you a book sale there. And I hope 
the people who are listening to this will also support you on your Kickstarter. I think it's great what you're doing. I know it's very difficult and extremely unprofitable. <laughs> that's it's, oh. yeah, This is not a money, like I'm not getting rich, that's for sure. <laughs> no, no, not at all. People will say like, your Kickstarter raised $20,000. I'm like, yeah, and I spent 19. <laughs> that's right, exactly, yeah. And I have to pay income tax on that. <laughs> exactly. like, oh, great. <laughs> so um, it's a very tough thing that what you're doing and it's a very um, financially, it's not lucrative at all. And so I know you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart, or at least a sense of adventure, and not for any kind of profit motive. Uh, and I and I think it's it it's it's great. Now, what is your? So I want to read the book, and then after I read it, I would love to interview you about certain passages and okay ideas. Uh oh, about it. now now I better go back and make sure they're all they're all up to snuff. <laughs> That's all right. Um, and then well, once we do, I mean, there'll be a few months down the line, or whenever you have your next promotion or next you're launching another trip For which sure. brings to my next question which is what is your people like you like to just they can't just rest on their laurels they have to go off and what is a laurel by the way when people say i rest on your laurels i've that... always wondered if it's something to do with like the back of your butt like yeah. i don't know behind your quads what do you call that? that i don't know laurel what is a laurel That's, we should okay. google that anyway exactly we <laughs> should but we're too busy talking to each other so let's see um what is your next trip uh dan greck I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of dreams. Um, I don't have a lot of money, which is a okay. problem. Right now, I'm going to launch Kickstarter a... Kickstarter will help you with that, well, dude. Yeah, You're going to make right. thousands. Oh. You're going to be rich with Kickstarter. Yeah, I'll be able to buy like 10 tanks of gas for the Jeep. It'll be great. <laughs> um, I'm doing a cross-Canada speaking tour this summer, uh, 2020. Oh, sorry. Can I interrupt you? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, you said you have no money. Do you have an estimate of roughly how much money it costs you to travel to Africa for, did you say three years, 35 countries? Yeah, what I, I don't like to say the whole number because people think it's really daunting. So what I always say, I, I'm like an- $80,000. No, less than that. Um, okay. So I'm like an overlanding nerd and I talk to lots of overlanders on the road and you know how much you're spending and this and that. And pretty much everyone driving around the world spends between $1,500 and $2,500 per month for absolutely everything. All right. lodging, all gas, all visas, all camping, everything, everything. Right, and but so, it might, you might have to pay for the car itself. Yeah, on top of that would right. be the car itself. Right. The fixed um, the fixed cost. Right, So, and it's your choice whether you go on the low end of that. Like when I drove Alaska to Argentina, I spent about 1200 bucks a month for everything mm. because I cooked all my own food and I camped wild a lot, you know, and I didn't do expensive activities. Um, mm. In Africa, if you wanted to eat at restaurants and drink a bottle of wine every night, you know, you could easily spend three grand a month. It wouldn't even be hard. So it, right. it, it's the individual's choice. I spent about sixteen to seventeen hundred a month uh, for everything. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Which, okay, which interestingly, I always say I was spending about twelve hundred dollars a month just to go to work every day. Yeah. When I when I had in, a job in, in, a, Canada. in a city in Canada, car yeah, insurance, sure. health insurance, rent, of course. food. Of course. Yeah. So it, yeah. it kind which of costs, once again, it's... It costs the same amount of money to drive around the world as it does to just stay home and go to work. It's one of the great secrets that nomads have yeah. and some people just haven't learned it yet. That's and, right. Uh, I commend yeah. you for doing that. Okay, so now you need to go back into money saving mode, I suppose. Yes, that's right. And that's your 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 goal right now. You're going to go yep. back and do the same desk job that you had before? I'm currently trying hard to avoid it. <laughs> My goal is not. Um, so I'm, I'm kicking off a speaking tour across Canada where I'll tell stories, show photos and videos about that doesn't about pay, my time dude, in Africa. Usually. I'm hoping that it might. What? Very little. I mean, in, uh, it, I, I hope you're wrong. I mean, <laughs> I hope I'm wrong, but uh, it's it's hard to get people to pay you, let's say, more than three thousand, four thousand, five thousand dollars per speech. Well, that's a lot. To... I don't need that much. Okay, I understand. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, is that even if you get a thousand, you know, just the, Canada's a big little country. You know, it's like <laughs> big little country. It, it's a big country, and it and it. Just driving across, you can just spend hundreds of dollars just going from one town to the other, it's just true. in fuel prices. It's true. Um, it's and true. so if you're only charging $1,000 per speech, you could be spending hundreds of dollars just getting to the next town to do the next speech. Yeah, you're exactly and right. So, this is certainly an interesting problem, and I don't actually know how it's going to go yet. I'm kind of okay. just, I want to I mean, try I wish it. you the best. I want to try to see best. if it works, because then I'll know. You know, in five years, All I'll right. look back and I'll say, I'm really glad I tried that, even if it didn't work. 
Right, right, right. But yeah. then your plan B is if then you would then go back to your, sell your soul to the devil yeah. and that company. That's right. That yeah. I hope they're not listening. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's plan B, and it's well, it's plan Z, but there aren't any in between, I guess. Okay, and 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 that job, and that's another thing that a lot of people I think don't realize that getting a job in the healthy economies that the high income countries generally have is surprisingly easy. It's really easy. Yep. Right, and so we have this notion that. If I give up my job, I'm never going to get another job ever again. Exactly. This is going to be the last job I'm ever going to be hired for. And so I can't leave it yep. because I, when I come back, I'll be jobless yep. forever. Yep. And that's like <laughs> terrifying because if you're jobless, then you're homeless, then you're destitute. Right. Yeah. And what nomads often teach the world is that, no, there's you can find a job quite easily, especially, of course, if you don't have if you're not hyper picky on the level of income that you need um or you don't have some obscure job you know like if you're a if your your talent is to be an and uh, a teacher of anthropology right there's not too many anthropology positions in universities open every year right and it's probably a competitive i imagine and so then the anthropology professor is like well if i leave this post who knows when i'm going to get another one and so i'll have to you know do a menial job Yep. that pays far less and so i understand that those people who have very special jobs but a lot of people don't have such unique skill sets that's right and and i've always thought one of the great things is because i never climbed the ranks at work i'm not a specialist like a professor of anthropology <clears throat> i'm just a bland old teacher so i can i can literally go anywhere in the entire world almost and just get a job teaching english and like that's the, i mean there's thousands of them all over the world and I'm willing to do that. And yeah, I'll make less money than a professor of anthropology, but it's easy to get a job. Right, yeah. right. Dan, I could talk to you for many more hours. <laughs> yes, yeah, me too. Um, but but uh, unfortunately, our listeners have a time limit. I'm sure some of them actually have real lives. Well, like you and I, me. I don't know why they would do that. <laughs> it seems crazy to me. We're so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, thank you so much for all your time. We've talked for about an hour and a half and it's uh, been fascinating and I would love to, I'll, I'm going to order your book. Awesome. Once again, remind people, go to uh, The Road Found, Chose Me. Sorry, the Road the Chose book. Me, yeah. And that's across Instagram, YouTube, and then the website or just on Kickstarter, they can just search for The Road Chose Me. Right. And yeah. then go ahead and order it. And then if you listen to this podcast after March 22nd, is that? March 14th. March 14th, 2020, if it listened to it afterwards, the the book will be available on Amazon and other places. It will, that's right. Yep. Yeah. And the first one is already on Amazon. Right. And yep. so, yeah, the first book. And then you can still get the color book, I mean, the picture book and all these other things. That's right. And so last thing I'll leave the listeners, if you're on the fence about supporting Dan's projects or not like, oh, do I really want to read his book? You know, I've already heard the whole podcast. I kind of know a lot of the story. Uh, or if you're on the fence or like, is his photos book really good? Does he know how to take photos? If you're on the fence about that, buy the fucking book. Help the dude out because, you know, it's for a good cause. You know, he's he's poured his heart out. So I would just say, if you're on the fence about whether you should support the project or not, if you don't like the book after you read it, then give it away to somebody else. Inspire somebody else and say, hey, read this book. You might like it if you like to travel. And it's not going to go to waste. Don't throw it in the garbage. You know, share it with some other people. So that's my advice. Dan. You're awesome. Love you. Talk to you later. Thanks, Francis. That was fun. See ya. Yeah.